It goes without saying that when members and friends of the International Oak Society get together, acorns are at the top of our list of possible subjects of conversation. We are obsessed with them. We desire them. We especially like to turn them into trees. We don't very often exchange acorn recipes, though. And I'm wondering how many of us have ever eaten them. I'm sure that many of us have tasted them, but how many of us have actually gone through all the steps involved in processing them to cook something with them? I'm betting probably not very many. The fact is that today, except for possibly in Korea, acorns are not a major or easily accessible food source in any part of the world. But has this always been the case? Were acorns an important food source in proto-historical and historical times in different countries and civilizations in the old world? Were acorns an important food source in prehistory? Did acorn consumption play an important role in developing the complex set of behaviors that eventually led to what is referred to as the Neolithic Revolution? The specific focus of this review is the area that archaeologists refer to as the Near East and Europe a little bit, and the transitions that took place there from hunter-gatherer societies to subsistence, uh, to agricultural economies. There are many, many historical and ethnographic references to eating acorns in the Near East and in Europe, and an examination of this information shows that there is a definite downtrend in the reputation of eating acorns. From Hesiod's Golden Age to Greek foundation myths where eating acorns was one of the steps on the road to civilization, through to Pliny the Elder's remark that in the vast expanse of the Hercynian oak forest, untouched by the ages, the trees are practically all of the acorn-bearing class of oak, which is ever held in honor at Rome. Acorns at this very day constitute the wealth of many races, even when they are enjoying peace. From these very positive connotations, there is a shift from about the fourth century of the current era, during which acorn consumption becomes something that is referred to almost exclusively during difficult times, or more generally by the poor, or even by the morally and historically backward. An examination of this information shows that these references are almost without exception lacking in detail. And my initial assumption was that they're lacking in detail because this is what happens to information when it gets repeated from secondary source to secondary source. But in fact, an examination of the primary sources shows that this detail was never there. These things were sort of noted in passing because as one author has remarked, a great deal has been written about the diet of the rich and not very much about the diet of the poor. Staple resource or famine food is a question that is often lingering in the background in discussions on acorn consumption. The implication being that if it has been a staple resource, its significance in the development of civilizations is much greater than if it has been just a famine food. But if we change that question a little bit to, has it been a staple resource precisely because it was a famine food, then the significance is somewhat greater if we consider that Difficult times have been the rule rather than the exception in the recent and not so recent past, if only judging from the frequency of war, the collapse of civilizations, and general upheaval. <laughs> in a recent study in central Anatolia, an ethnographic study undertaken specifically to provide archaeologists with clues in reconstructing ancient diet, part of the methodology consisted in questioning different households in two different income categories to determine whether or not there were differences in attitude about wild plant food gathering. Those interviewed from the lower income category revealed a rich knowledge of wild food sources, including acorns from all of the oaks growing in their region, while those in the upper income category denied that such practices still existed. Much like a 17th century French physician, Louis Lemery, who reported incredulously and with some repugnance that in France people were still eating acorns. In a French study that was undertaken very recently, in an interesting approach to the question, they in 12th to 14th century France, the fruits eaten in 12th to 14th century France, they examined three sources of information. The market transaction and taxation documents, the corporological remains found in the rubbish pits, and the French culinary texts of the time. The market transaction and taxation documents show that acorns appear as frequently as chestnuts, walnuts, and pine nuts. The coprological remains showed that acorns were as recurrent as peaches, plums, wild cherry, and strawberry, sloe, and elderberry. 
The only source from which acorns were missing were the French culinary texts of the time, representative of the food served on noble and middle class tables. It's not easy to determine what the role of acorn consumption may have been in these very advanced agricultural and merchant-based societies that have left us what is known, let have left us what is known as the cuneiform sources. What is qualitatively significant is that the only plant foods that are recurrent in these documents are pomegranates, walnuts, and acorns. From various different documents, including merchant requests for acorns, bills of sale, documents pertaining to plots of land planted with acorn producing trees, scholars have ascertained that there were four oak acorn words, possibly referring to four different species. And there is also, in one of the rare exceptions to a historical reference that is not lacking in detail, the Book of Nabataean Agriculture. This was written in the third or fourth century of our era and is thought to be a kind of encyclopedia of ancient Babylonian tradition and culture. In this book, there are detailed instructions for collecting and processing acorns for human consumption and many recipes for making acorn bread. If we look now to the Proto-Indo-Europeans and what we know about the development of the Indo-European languages, there is a rich oak acorn vocabulary. There are at least two words that are thought to have meant oak and a third word which is thought to mean tree, but which is also thought to have meant originally oak, and that from this original meaning, it shifted to become the generic tree word. So there is some divergence of opinion about the oak words, but there is unanimous acceptance for the acorn word. And the rich semantics of this word and the fact that it is of the animate gender, whereas all other plant foods are of the inanimate gender, may suggest but to linguist, anthro linguistic anthropologists that the acorns would have been very important in these cultures. The earliest written traces of Proto-Indo-European that we have are from the extinct Anatolian group, and the best attested of these is Hittite. 25,000 clay tablets were recovered from the Hittite capital in Hattusa, and these deal mostly with administrative matters and mythology. When in Hittite mythology, when the god Telipinu disappears, mist sees the windows, smoke sees the house. In the field and corral, the animals were stifled. <coughs> the sheep refused her lamb, the cow refused her calf. Telipinu went off and took away growth and plenty from the wilderness. The mountains, trees, pastures, and springs dried up. Famine appeared in the land. Humans and gods perished from hunger. I asked a Hittite scholar whose specific subject is the god Telipinu if this implied relationship to nourishment was to be taken literally or figuratively, and his answer was quite categoric. Telipinu was the god of many things, but he was specifically associated with providing food. It's not a pine tree. <laughs> <laughs> what does the Paleolithic archaeobotanical record tell us? Plant remains from near eastern archaeological sites in the form of waterlogged, carbonized, or mineralized seed, fruit, wood, or bark is extremely rare. Nevertheless, there is evidence to suggest that hominins have been eating acorns for a very, very long time. At Geshur Bunat Yaakov in present-day Israel, a site dated to 780,000 years ago and thought to have been inhabited for 100,000 years, archaeologists have recovered paleobotanical evidence of four species of nuts, including acorns and the lithic artifacts used to process them. You will notice that although the acorn fragments are not the most numerous, they are found in all of the excavated layers. And this ubiquity is thought to be perhaps more important than simply the total number of remains. Maybe even hominins have been eating acorns for an even longer time. At Tel Ubadia, a site dated to 1.5 million years, archaeologists have recovered lithic artifacts, including hammers and anvils, but also pitted stones, like the pitted stones found at Geshe Benot Yaakov. Unfortunately, but quite expectedly, no plant remains have been recovered from this site. From the middle Paleolithic, Kabara Cave, much further south and along the Mediterranean shore, Inhabited between 60,000 and 48,000 years ago, archaeological excavations have recovered 4,205 plant remains in very good condition, of which 43 acorn fragments have been identified. 
There is evidence to suggest that this cave was inhabited in the fall when acorns, but also game, would have been abundant. And it has been hypothesized that the acorns, but also the pistachios, could have been stored to be eaten elsewhere and later, in the spring and in the winter, when other resources would have been scarce. This is, of course, significant because food storage, like multi-step processing, is one of the components of complex social structures. Another middle Paleolithic site, Amud Cave, Ex dated to about the same period as Kabara Cave. Excavations here have revealed only plant material that was too charred and fragmentary to be of any use, but phytolith analysis has shown that the characteristic phytoliths of woody plants are only slightly less significant than the characteristic phytoliths of grass plants. From the upper Paleolithic Ohalo II, the true star of Near Eastern Paleobotany, 90,000 plant remains were uh, recovered from this 23,000 year old site, of which 43 acorn fragments have been identified. And finally, from the boundary between the Upper Paleolithic and uh, between the Upper Paleolithic and the Epi Paleolithic, Okuzini Cave, 17,000 years old, 51 acorn fragments have been identified. How are these numbers to be interpreted? Because all, because different plant material, different types of material are affected by different selective processes, not all organic material stands the same chance of being preserved. This in turn leads to a bias in the archeological record, the so-called taphonomic bias. Up until very recently, plant remains from archeological sites have never been interpreted in terms of any of the factors relating to taphonomy. In addition, widely different methodologies, especially in sampling and analysis, make it very difficult to compare existing data to determine whether apparent differences in acorn presence represent real differences in acorn use or simply differences in methodology. It is widely recognized today that acorns would have been processed at the collection site and not at the settlement site where archeological excavations take place. It stands to reason then that anything that would have been discarded would have been discarded at the collection site and not at the settlement site. It is also widely recognized today that the degradation of very fragile acorn remains during formation processes is largely responsible for their scarcity in the archaeobotanical record. Intensive recovery techniques for recovering fragile plant remains like acorn pericarps and cotyledons were only developed in the 1970s and only widely adopted in the 1990s. All of the sites that I have mentioned were initially excavated in the first half of the 20th century. And for more recent sites like Ohalo II, excavated using modern techniques of flotation and sieving, it is now recognized that even gentler techniques are needed in order to preserve these very fragile remains. In addition to this taf oh, that's supposed to be in the middle. In addition to this taphonomic bias there, that needs to be taken into consideration in order to properly interpret the archaeobotanical record, there is an epistemological bias that I think has four components to it. Number one, all of the edible nuts in the Near Eastern Paleobotanical Record are still eaten today. Acorns are not. Therefore, they have never been traditionally sampled or analyzed as being a food source. Number two, decades of hunter-gatherer uh, archaeology specifically interested in hunter-gatherer dynamics have almost exclusively focused on animal food sources. Number three, when wild plant foods and wild plant food gathering activities have been taken into account, they have largely been considered as secondary, like the gender with which they are associated. And yet, it is an absolute necessity for hominins to include something in their diet that will reduce the toxic nitrogen load that comes from metabolizing meat protein. In very cold environments, this is done by eating large amounts of fat. In the temperate zone, this is done by eating plant foods that will deliver bulk carbohydrates and a little bit of fat. Although specific nutritional composition varies greatly from species to species, acorns are very low in protein and fat and extremely high in carbohydrates, as much as 90% or more for many white oak species. The fourth component in this epistemological bias, and I think the most important, is that when archaeologists have been interested in plant food sources, they have been looking for cultivation and missing the point. 
I don't know whether this should be characterized as deterministic or panglossian, but the idea that agriculture was the inevitable outcome of social evolution and that hunter-gatherer societies were without complex plant food management practices and without highly developed ecological intelligence has been the dominant view for a long time. As though hunter-gatherer, paleolithic hunter-gatherer behavior represented little more than pre-adaptations on the way to an anticipated agricultural destination on evolutionary interstates with no exits. And I might add, with no interesting stops in between. The terms Neolithic revolution and agricultural revolution are often used synonymously. And yet there is increasing evidence to show that agriculture was one of the last elements to be put in place during the Neolithic and not the first, enabling, as it has been thought for a long time, all of the other ones. There is evidence from Mexico, from South America, from Asia, and from the Near East that shows, for example, that the increase in population density was not the result of agriculture, but preceded it. The recognition of these different biases has led, of course, to very new and interesting ways of thinking about subsistence economies, and I think that a very good illustration of this is our changing understanding of the Natufian civilization. The Natufian civilization developed in the southern Levant, in the Mediterranean forest belt, where oak and pistachio would have been dominant. The Natufians had a great number of very advanced cultural characteristics, a high degree of sedentism, um, rituals, uh, sculpture, different, form, different art forms, jewelry. And, and because they had these highly developed cultural characteristics, the traditional assumption was that this was because they had begun serial exploitation and that this would eventually lead to the first Neolithic, true Neolithic communities in the area. There is today a raging debate between the proponents of this classical model and a new school of thought that says, rubbish. Why would these people be collecting cereals when they would have had acorns, a much more abundant and efficient resource where they were? What is the evidence? A large part of the classical model reposes on the idea that during climate warming, after the last glacial maximum, there would have been two periods where the climate became progressively drier and colder, that this would have led to a decrease in forest cover and an increase in grasses, making this an attractive resource. But the latest palynological evidence shows that the southern Levant would not have been particularly impacted by these climate events and that the arboreal population would not have changed significantly. And phytolith analysis from the early Natufian also shows that woody plants were dominant. And phytolith analysis from the late Natufian shows that small seeded grasses would have been dominant, once again questioning this idea of incipient agriculture by the Natufians. The paleobotanical record from Natufian sites is miserably poor. There's a little bit of barley and a few other things. Okay, there are no acorns, but cereals, unlike acorns, especially in charred or carbonized conditions, as is the case in these sites, stand a very, very good chance of being preserved. So while taphonomic bias might explain the absence of acorns, it does not seem to explain the scarcity of cereals that we would expect to find in much greater numbers if indeed this were the primary food source of the Natufians. If we look at some data about acorn processing versus cereal processing, both in terms of the time needed to process one kilo and in terms of calorific return, clearly you'd have had to be mad to be a Natufian and choose cereals as your primary food source. The arduousness of grinding cereals has never been, has always been underestimated. In the cuneiform sources, there are several collections that are referred to as the letters from Babylonia. This is a part of one of them. Come back before your wife and daughter die from the work of constantly grinding barley while in detention. Please get your wife and daughter out of this. <laughs> One of two things must be true here. Either these women had been imprisoned for committing some crime and this was their punishment, the sort of Mesopotamian equivalent of the chain gang, or they were being specifically detained to accomplish this task. Either way, it has to make you think of how really difficult it must have been to grind cereals, even cultivated cereals, which is the case here. It also made me wonder about the social and political organization of a society whose penal system was somehow associated with food production. 
the picture that seems to emerge from all of this is that epipaleothic plant management practices do not emerge as pre-adaptations on the road to food production. Cereals were not the focus of plant gathering and are also unlikely to have been cultivated. This does not imply that cereals were not used at all, only that they are unlikely to have been long-term staple foods, as is sometimes implied in the literature. In the absence of massive paleobotanical evidence, what other sources are available to help elucidate this question? Grinding stones. What did grinding stones grind? True ground stone assemblages begin to appear during the Upper Paleolithic and become extremely nu numerous during the Natufian. Traditionally, the relationship between cereals and grinding stones has been emphasized and their presence on archaeological sites is often taken as direct evidence for cereal exploitation. What did Chinese grinding stones grind? In a great, fantastic study that was done in 2010 using use wear analysis and starch residue analysis, it was found that these grinding stones were grinding acorns. And what, I'm sure you're asking, were the plant remains found at these Shigu sites where these grinding stones were found? Surely we'd expect to find tons of acorn remains if this is what they were grinding predominantly. The only food plants that were remains that were found in these sites were hazelnuts, walnuts, elm fruit, and jujube. No acorns. The authors conclude that these grinding stones were used for processing a variety of plant foods, but predominantly acorns. The presence of grinding stones in the early Neolithic sites should no longer be used as an indicator of intensive agriculture based on cereals, but instead it is more likely to suggest a wide spectrum subsistence economy with a particular focus on acorn exploitation. I have used this um, example from the Chinese Neolithic because, unfortunately, all of the ground stone assemblages from Near Eastern Paleolithic and Neolithic sites have been scrupulously and systematically washed, and therefore no starch residue analysis is possible. But use wear analysis is, is, is becoming more popular as an archaeological tool, so maybe in the future we will know more about these ground stone assemblages from the Natufian. Much like the, appearance, the presence of grinding stones is taken as evidence for agriculture, the onset of dental pathologies in prehistoric populations is also taken as an indication of cereal exploitation. But at the Grotte des Pigeons site in Morocco from the Capsian culture, archaeologists have recovered a significant number of pine nut and acorn remains and a significant number of human skeletal remains with a high incidence of dental caries and associated pathologies. Therefore, this research also calls into question the idea that dental pathologies must be associated with agricultural societies. What does the Neolithic archaeobotanical record tell us? The Capsian culture from North Africa was a very sophisticated culture with um, rituals, figure, art, abstract and figurative rock art, jewelry, etc. Up until very recently, the only information about diet concerned exclusively animal food resources. The most recent excavations have recovered significant numbers of pine nuts and acorns in very bad condition. Three taxa have been identified, and although the numbers are not extremely high, the pine nut and acorn fragments are found throughout the excavated sites. The most important Neolithic site in the Near East, in central Anatolia, Katel Hoyuk, 8,000 years old, thought to have been inhabited for more than 1,000 years. It was a very important center of commerce and culture, and at one time was thought to have had a population of more than 5,000. It was first excavated in 1958 by James Mellart, a very colorful character. He was assistant director of the British Institute of Archaeology in Ankara. He was a respected professor, and he was a consummate thief. And he was kicked out of Turkey for selling Neolithic art through the black market. He was later allowed to return, then only to be banned forever for equally scandalous reasons. And the site was closed for more than 30 years, only to be reopened in the last decade of the 20th century. The original Mellart excavations did not do any plant recovery. They just reported um, a qualitative appreciation of plant presence, and acorns are noted as being present throughout the layers. The most recent excavations have recovered 4,000 plant remains in 61 archaeological contexts, of which 20 acorn bases and more than 1.5 kilos of acorn pericarps. In 
the as yet unpublished results of a several year long study of 17 Neolithic sites in the northeastern Iberian Peninsula using extremely laborious recovery methods. The results show that the best represented fruit of woodland taxa in the early Neolithic are hazelnuts and acorns. From the middle Neolithic, again, hazelnuts and acorns. And from the late Neolithic, the best represented fruit from woodland taxa were pine nuts and acorns. It is significant, again, to note that acorns were found throughout the entire area studied, while the other plant food remains were found only associated with specific sites. So, have any of the questions that I asked in the beginning of this presentation been even partially answered? Were acorns an important food source in proto-historical and historical times in different countries and civilizations of the old world? Yes, I think that it can be shown very easily in both ethnographically and historically that acorns are an important component of long-term collective memory, a key factor in social resilience and adaptive change. Were acorns an important food source in prehistory? Although there is no conclusive paleobotanical evidence, the taphonomy and epistemology can reasonably account for their scarcity in the archaeobotanical record and for bias in their sampling and interpretation. And there is a great deal of indirect evidence to suggest that, yes, acorns were an important food source during the Upper Paleolithic and continue to play this role during the Neolithic alongside the development of cereal-based societies. Did acorn consumption play an important role in developing the complex set of behaviors that eventually led to what is referred to as the Neolithic Revolution? Of all of the nuts in the Near Eastern Paleobotanical Record, acorns are the only ones that require multi-step processing, including cooking, to be eaten. Cereals can be, and even were, initially eaten raw. This timely, dexterous unpacking, in other words, knowing when and knowing how to use a resource, can be considered the baseline of modern cognition. It is obviously not possible to address all of the aspects of this fascinating question or all of the questions that germinate around these acorn considerations. One of the most interesting ones being the question posed by Antoine Kremer in the last issue of International Oaks. Did early human populations in Europe facilitate the dispersion of oaks? To conclude, if I may, I would like to ask one more question. If it is shown sometime in the future, unequivocally, that acorns played an important role as a food source in the Upper Paleolithic and during the Neolithic, alongside the development of cereal-based agricultures, why were they abandoned? If we adopt the position that agriculture cannot be represented as the inevitable outcome of social evolution, and if we accept the fact that there is nothing inherently or objectively superior about cereals versus acorns, and if we consider the evidence that in the Near East, anyway, this change was not driven by climate change, then why and how was this choice made? Thank you very much for your attention.